Okay, welcome back to our second lesson in the processing language. In the first lesson, we went through some of the tutorials available on the site and got a little bit familiar with the language. Uh, in this tutorial, we're going to go through, get a little bit more familiar, and we're going to look at how we can use some of the drawing commands to create string art. Yes, string art. Straight out of the 1970s. You can look up string art and you'll see that there's all sorts of lovely images out here of string art creations that people have created over the years. Basically, uh, for creating string art, you pound a bunch of nails into a board and then you connect them with string. It actually looks pretty cool. Well, okay. Art, it's up to you. But we're going to take a look at how we can use the processing language to create some string art of our own. And I think that's going to look pretty cool. So before we begin, I wanted to show you a couple of neat things that you can change in the processing preferences here. So if you've got processing open, uh, come up to file and come to your preferences. And in your preferences, uh, we took a look at that last time because it uh, allowed you to know where your sketchbook folder was going to be, the default location for saving your files. But uh, one of the things that we're going to do to maybe make some of what I'm doing a little bit easier to read is we're going to change the editor font size and we're going to pump that up to 18. And I'll just click OK right now. And as you can see, all the text in here got a little bit bigger. That's useful if you're doing a presentation on a large screen for an audience. So that was under File, Preferences. The other really cool thing that they've built into uh, the processing IDE, Integrated Development Environment, the software that you use to create your code, is this option right here, Code Completion with Control Space. So let's just turn that on and let's take a moment to see what that's going to do because I think you'll like it. Click on OK and come back in here. And say you were typing in a, a, a command in here, you wanted to set the background in your setup command right here. So you're like, oh, is it background, background screen? Type in back and then hit control space. And when you hit control space, all of the possible commands that could be used or variables that could be used, every word that processing knows that begins with back comes in there and it tells you a little bit about what's it, what it's going to expect. So for instance, when you type in background, it's going to expect a floating point value in there. Uh, there's also a value uh, called backspace, all in capitals. So if you wanted to read whether or not the backspace character was being read. So this is really cool uh, because it can help you uh, reduce your typos. So for instance, even if you have B typed in there, you can hit control space and here's all of the different commands and variables and settings that you could put in there that begin with B. So you can say brightness, blend, whole bunch of things that we don't need to worry about right now. And uh, if it was background you wanted, you can just double click on that and then you can type in your background value. Remember that down at the bottom of the screen right here, okay, you've got this helpful error bar that is going to uh, show you where what you're doing wrong. So the function background expects parameters like background int. So it expects an integer variable in there. Okay, so if you go ahead and put an integer variable in there, okay, now it's happy and it says, but keep in mind you're missing a semicolon. And you can put the semicolon in and your errors disappear. One other thing you can do if you've got multiple errors, say I've uh, you know, edited a few things up in there and I've got multiple errors, you can come to the errors tab and it will tell you where you're missing the tabs and uh, what line you're missing the tabs uh, or what line you're <laughs> missing that curly bracket on, where all of your errors are. So uh, it's very useful to be able to go in there and check that out. I'm just going to hit Control-Z, Control-Z, and in fact, I don't need that command in there. Okay, so here's our first program. You'll have to type it in. It's not very long. We start out by setting some variables right up here. 
uh, we're going to work with X. And originally when I was playing around, I used Y. You don't really need Y in there for trying what we're going to do. Get rid of that right now. Okay, this sets up something called a global variable. That means that any functions we add later on are going to be able to see that X. Now, we'll talk about functions a little bit later on in this tutorial. The first function that we come to is our setup routine, runs once at the beginning of the program, and this is where we set the size of the screen. And I've chosen 640 by 480, um, just because it should fit nicely on most people's screens. Again, we've got the uh, curly brackets, the ellipses holding everything together. That executes once, and it comes to draw. And uh, here we go, we set our background. Now when we set the background, that also clears the screen. And this is a for loop. Okay, so the for loop, we've got three numbers in here that really matter. The first one, we say x is going to start equal to zero, and we're allowed to use x because up here we told it that x was going to be an integer value. So then we tell it x is less than or equal to 640. That means that we're going to keep increasing x until it reaches a value of 640 or higher, at which case we'll stop increasing x and we'll kick out of the loop. And then we're going to tell it that x plus equals 10. Now, this is a shorthand way of saying x equals x plus 10, basically incrementing x by 10 every time this loop repeats. So what's going to start in here as we're going to come in here, the first thing it's going to see is x is equal to 0. It's going to say, is x less than 640? Well, yes, 0 is less than 640. So it is then going to go and execute everything in between those squiggly brackets, which in this case is going to draw a line from 320 to 40, which is halfway in both the width and the height, so in the middle of the screen. And it's going to draw that to x comma zero. Now the first time around our x is at zero, so it'll go from 320 to 40 to zero comma zero. We'll come to this squiggly bracket right here. It'll kick right back around here and it'll execute this code again, except this time it will have gone through and added 10 to x. So x will now be equal to 10 and it'll say is x uh, 10 still less than 640? Yep. And then it will go ahead and execute this command again, except now we're going to have a value of 10 in here. And next time we do this, it'll have a value of 20, and then 30, and then 40, and then 600, and then 620, and then 640. Now you have to take a look up here and say, will it execute at exactly 640? In this case, it will execute at exactly 640 because we've said less than or equal to 640. So if x equals 640, it will still execute. If we just said x is less than 640, it wouldn't execute because um, x is not less, when x is 640, it's not less than 640, it is 640. So in order for this to be true and execute, this will execute right up until the point where x becomes greater than 640. Okay, have you had a chance to type it in? Take a pause, type it in, and let's see if you get the same thing that I do. There we go. Just move this up over here so we can see our code. So what we saw right here is we're always starting at 32240 which is right in the middle of the screen. And we're drawing our lines to x comma zero. The first time around, it's zero comma zero, then 10 comma zero, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, all the way up until we get to 640 comma zero. Could you make it draw those lines along the bottom as well? Pause the video here and see if you can get this to also draw the lines along the bottom of your screen. Okay, hopefully you've been able to get it to draw lines along the bottom of the screen. Here's how I'd go about drawing those lines on the bottom of the screen as well. 
I'd add another command right here. I'd say line 320, 240. So I'm starting at the same point. I'm going to continue going to X, but this time I'm going to go all the way out to the bottom of the screen, which is going to be at 480 because we made that screen to be 480 high. And if we execute that code, now we've got lines going to the top and along the bottom. How about the sides? Can you figure out how to get those lines to draw out from the middle out to the sides, just like we've done for the top and the bottom? Go ahead and press pause on the video and see if you can get lines to come from the center out to the side and the center out to this side. Okay, uh, hopefully you've been able to come along and figure that one out, but we're going to add two more line commands. Again, we're going to start at 320, 240 right in the middle of the screen, but this time we're going to go to zero, okay, comma x, and here we're going to go to B20, or sorry, that's going to be 640, comma, x. Now, if you've solved this problem on your own, you're probably going to say, Jason, you're going to run into a problem with that. It works so well, except for these little lines right down here at the bottom. Well, what happened with those ones right there is we were doing great, and we were coming down right here, and we were coming down right here, but then we came too far in this direction. So maybe there's a better way to go about doing that. Let's try giving this section its own loop. So let's take these out of this loop. Okay, and if we run that, we're back to where we were just a moment ago. We've got top and bottom. And let's give them a new loop right here. So we're going to say for, we'll start over again and we'll keep abusing this poor variable x and this time x is going to go less than equal to 480 x plus equals 10 incrementing x by 10 every time and let's add a line. Now Again, we've got our code completion. So you can type li, hit control space, and here's all the different commands that begin with li. Okay, I have to admit, line's pretty easy to remember to enter. Okay, this one even adds some comment commas for you so you can remember what's going to enter right in here. We'll start at 320, 240, and this time we'll go from zero to x, and we better remember to add our semicolon right in there, and then we'll line, okay, 320, comma, 240, to 640, comma, x, and it tells us that we are missing a right curly bracket because we open this one up, this one right here should be closing off, matched up to right there. Let's make sure we've got matching braces in here. Where you put those brackets is pretty important to the logical execution of your program. If you ever need to check and make sure that everything's in the right place, there is an auto format tool, uh, slightly different place than in the Arduino. Here it is under edit and it's auto format and you can just hit control T on the keyboard if that works easier for you and it arranges your screen so it's easy to read. And each time you create a curly bracket, uh, it indents the lines for you. All right, let's see if that runs. And there we go. We have the great vortex of doom coming out right there and it sucks you right into the screen. Now we've set this to be 640 by 480, but of course we can make this considerably larger. 
because up here we can come in here and we can set this to 800 by 600, another popular screen resolution. But the catch is now it didn't take advantage of that entire screen resolution because although we made this change right up here, we'd have to go through and change it everywhere else in the program. If we don't want to uh, have to go through and change that every time we change the screen resolution, we can use some parameters to make this run a little bit easier. So the parameters that we have to work with are width and height. The uh, processing language knows that the width of your screen should be referred to as width. And you'll see that it changes color when you type that in and that this will be referred to as height. So that will uh, give us uh, a bigger range of variables. But the catch is we still want our center point to be centered in the middle of the screen. So we can say right here, we can set this to width divided by two and 240 can become height divided by two. So that set this at half of the width and half of the height. Set this one at width divided by two. Divided by two. And then of course, we're always gonna start these lines at zero, but on the other side of the screen, we want to draw them out to their full height. And in here, we can make the same changes with divided by two. Height divided by two and from zero out to X, that makes sense. And here we're going to go with divided by two and height divided by two. And finally, we're going to change this to width. Okay, and now if we run that, our new parametric form automatically updates to the 800 by 600 screen, but we can also update it to a 1024 by 768 screen. And if you wonder the sizes that I'm choosing, these are standard monitor sizes uh, that have developed over the years. And there we go, it's all updated in there. But what's also cool is that we can also update it to a square screen or any size screen that we want and everything automatically updates. So we could go 640 wide and we could go 640 high. And once again, it all updates and all our parameters are refreshed so that you could take this to just about any device that you wanted. Your iPad has a different screen resolution than your Android phone has a different resolution from your uh, laptop computer, which might be different from your quad high def monitor if uh, you've got the kind of fancy bling at home and this will update uh, to keep you going. So there's a little bit of introduction to some string art and some parameters and how you can draw um, you know, lines emanating from the middle of the screen. Now, one of the really cool things about processing, as I was saying in the previous video, is that it has uh, tools in here, uh, including Tweak. And Tweak lets you play around with some really interesting things. In order to use Tweak, you have to save the file. And uh, now let's go ahead and just uh, come in here to sketch and let's go Tweak. Okay, now Tweak runs like normal right in here, but you can touch on something and you can change it. So right now, this is changing the brightness of our background. We can also come in here and we can change some of our variables in the loop. So if we space these numbers out further, you can see that now it's increasing 67 pixels in each of these horizontal steps. And you can bring it right down and really densify that up. And you can get some neat looking things happening in right there and you can balance it out really well. You can do the same thing on the side right here. 
So you can then get a sense on how things are moving around in here. I'm going to make these just a little more dense. Let's see if I can get them down to the same value or pretty close. There we go. Uh, you can even play around with the point where these are beginning because, uh, oh, don't divide by zero. I dragged it in the wrong direction. I created one of the great computer programming errors that mess people up all the time. Was and I drag this down, I hit with divided by zero. And you'll see I get this error right here, uh, division by zero error. Uh, of course, any number divided by zero is going to come out to be uh, pretty close to infinite. And uh, so we have to stop our program right here and uh, hit the stop button. Uh, no, we're not going to keep those changes. Let's try tweaking that again. Ah, okay, there we go. It's not dividing by zero anymore. Let me take this up a little bit higher. And now there we go. So you can play around with the position of that because now our enter position is with divided by five. And let's change these over to with divided by five. And now we've changed our center position right on here. So you can start getting some uh, interesting string art happening as you go about uh, do, doing these various functions right here. You could then come and rerun this code, uh, modify some things, add another few lines, and you could have start point right here where you had it at uh, width, uh, four times width divided by five. So at 80% of the way across the screen, where this is 20% of the way across the screen. So you can start creating all sorts of neat patterns with your string art right there. And just as you can play with uh, the width, you can play with the height on here. You can move that one up a little bit. You can move that one up a little bit. That one up a little bit. Don't go that far. We want them all at the same point. So you can start to play around in there. One of the things that you will see as you start to uh, experiment with this is you start getting some interesting pattern where the lines are really close together. And that's called MOIR, M-O-I-R-E. And uh, what it means is that the pixels are getting so close together that um, some, sometimes it just blends the pixels together and sometimes it doesn't because the lines are getting so close to each other that uh, you start to get an interference pattern between the two matching lines. So uh, some interesting things can start happening as you start to do that and play around with your string art. So there's some code to uh, help you uh, get going with some different ideas for uh, string art. And that's one way where you can draw things coming out parametrically from any position on the screen and coming out to all of the edges. One of my favorite uh, things to do uh, with string art, I'm not going to save those changes, it'll set it right back. I'm going to minimize this and I'm going to take a look at a program uh, that I call string art 1b. It's basically the same thing right on here. One of my favorite things to do is watch the drawings develop. And one of the uh, challenges that we do face in processing that makes it a little bit different from some other programming languages is that when you draw the line, it draws it into something called a screen buffer, which is a memory location. And it doesn't actually update your screen until it comes to the end of the draw loop. So all of the drawing and all of the work that we do in here, it all gets done invisibly to you and then it kicks it out once when you hit the end of the draw loop, which means that it makes it hard for us to see those loops uh, being uh, developed as we go through them. If we wanna see each line being drawn individually, we need to draw one line each time the draw loop happens. And so this is what we can do with this kind of line. There we go. We've got that running back and forth across the center of the screen. Now, how is this different from the previous code that we had open? Let me just bring that uh, code open and uh, string art one. There we go. I'm just going to compare this right in here. String art one to string art 1b. Now in here, everything was running within the loop. 
and it was all being drawn into the screen buffer and then we'd come down to the end right here and poof it would all appear on the screen instantly and we wouldn't get to see the lines being drawn one by one. Here what we're doing is we're drawing one line coming to this final bracket right here looping back around to our draw routine so that that line does get drawn. Now right now the first thing that happens is that it gets erased. So if we come in here and comment this code out Now you can see that code's getting drawn in there and the uh, lines going over top time and time again and it's filling that in giving us some uh, more detailed screen wire. Okay so uh, now what we can do is if we want to have that uh, go all the way around we can add additional line commands in here. So we can say uh, let's go line from width divided by 2 8 divided by 2 and let's come to uh, x comma height. And so that one's looping around the screen right like so and filling it in like so. Now the reason it's doing that is instead of using a for loop what we're doing is uh, we're incrementing x every time we go along. Here's our x increment. Instead of doing it in a for loop, we're taking a look in here and when we start draw, we say is x less than width? Well, we gave it a starting value of zero right up here. So the first time around it is, comes in here and increments it by 10, goes and runs the program, keeps doing that. Every time it comes through, x will be incrementing by 10 which is why it's sweeping across the screen right here. However, if x is ever greater than the width of the screen, this uh, section of code right in here does not execute, and this section of code right here does execute, and that resets x back to zero, so it'll keep drawing it around and across the screen. Okay, so that was just a little thing that you need to know about processing. Uh, if you were wondering why you weren't seeing the lines being drawn in there individually, you do have to give it a chance for the draw loop to update, for the screen buffer to actually be written to the screen. Up until that point, everything you're doing is just filling up a memory location that the computer can use, but you don't get to see. Okay, that was string art 1b. Let's take a look at what string art 2 looks like. Well, that's not very fancy. That's just a whole series of horizontal lines coming up and down here. But this is useful if you ever need to create a grid or graph paper for drawing something right in here. Uh, remember our stroke command, that sets the uh, color of the lines that we're creating. So if you wanted white lines, you could set that to 255, 255, 255 run the code. Now you've got white lines coming across the screen. Uh, the background, if you wanted it pitch black, you could uh, set it to 0, 255 if you want it to be bright, but drawing white lines on a white background is probably not that useful. Here we've got a for loop again, and the uh, trick right in here is that uh, we're drawing from one side of the screen to the other side of the screen from 0 to 640 because that's the width, and we're just uh, increasing that height all the way through. Now, there's one little glitch in here. Um, not really a glitch, the program runs okay, but we're drawing some of the lines off the screen because as we keep incrementing the height, we go all the way up to 640, but we'd said that the height of the screen was only 480. So there's a whole bunch of invisible lines down here that the computer drew. Since there's no room for them in the screen buffer, the computer just kind of forgets about them and they're kind of irrelevant to what we're doing. If you wanted to draw some horizontal lines so that you could get a grid, you could come in here and uh, you can copy this code right here. And you can paste that code right in there so it runs again, except this time you're going to run it so that the variable changes in this direction. You're going to go from i comma zero to 
i comma 640 or you could use the width variable uh, right in there uh, sorry did i say 640 uh, 480 And there you've got a grid on the screen. And keep in mind that because you've got access to the um, uh, tweak tool, you can close that window. You can come in here and you can go sketch. Remember to save it before you tweak it. And tweak. And there you go. And if you want to see the impact that you get by changing some of these values, you can change the density of your screen grid in either direction. You can change the color, change the hue. So you can experiment with a number of things that way. Same thing for the background. You can click on there, make it a brighter background. So whatever color you created shows up. So you can play around with some of this to get a pattern that looks interesting to you. If you don't want the lines to go all the way across the screen, reduce that number right in here and there we go you can see that we're reducing those so they only come part way down and if you don't want them to come all the way across that way you can reduce it so that you're only covering that corner of the screen right up there if you don't want them to come all the way across you can shorten them up like that and if you don't want them coming all the way across in here you can bring them down like that and now you've got a grid on just a small fraction of the screen. So one of the things I really do like about processing is that you do have this flexibility to play around with the colors and play around with the parameters to see if you're uh, going to get something that you like. Now, one of the things that I like to do in uh, uh, screen art, and it was always a fun challenge, uh, no, we're not gonna uh, change that, is I like to make it so that we can uh, get kind of a swoopy style and uh, let me just uh, run some code here and show you a little bit of what I'm looking at. There we go. This is filling in right here. I should probably add an additional delay when it finishes uh, everything so you can appreciate the true grandeur of this on its last pass through. And uh, when you start to add things like this is where um, uh, the uh, string art starts to get kind of interesting. I'm just going to stop this for a second here and take a look at what it's doing in here to make this happen. Okay, so here's our screen. And remember in processing, the top corner of the screen is 0, 0 right up here. And uh, we've got a width and a height for the screen. And we can use the terms width and height not with the capitals. Um, PowerPoint just likes to capitalize things for me, so uh, uh, we don't need to worry about them in our code. And what we're going to do is we're going to keep incrementing a number and coming further over this way and further over this way in incremental steps. And when we draw a line from right here, we'll draw a line down to this corner right here, and it's going to start incrementing up from this way. So as we move over further this way, the next line is going to come down in here. And the next line over here will come down over here. And then when we're drawing in here, this will be coming back over here. And this line will be coming down right here. Uh, same thing on the opposite side of the screen. And here's a little diagram that shows some of the parametr parametric ways of expressing the locations of those form uh, uh, coordinates. So what we've got happening right in here is uh, that we uh, set this up. And now stroke again, you can play with your color in stroke. Uh, stroke controls the color that you're working with. We give it some variables up here to start. I is equal to 0. Step is equal to 20. And then we come down here. And as the program executes, We set the stroke color. The line is uh, going to be uh, coming from i comma zero to zero comma height minus i. So we can fit these parameters in, and it will calculate height minus i 
and that will pass that through as a number. So when we were looking at that in PowerPoint, that line i comma zero, zero comma height minus i is i comma zero right there to zero comma height minus i right there. Our next line will go from i comma zero over to width comma i. i comma zero to width comma i. And then these ones will run along the bottom and they'll bounce off the two sides of the screens. So this will execute right here. And then I will increment by a value that we've said is step. So we've set step to be 20 to begin with. And uh, so long as I is less than the height of the screen, it's going to uh, uh, keep, uh, sorry, if I is greater, <laughs> I is greater, the big alligator is eating the eye because it's bigger. If I is greater than the height, then what's going to happen is it will come in here and we'll set I back to zero. We'll change our step. Okay, we'll take two off of the step unless the step starts to get less than uh, one because if the step is less than one, it's at zero and we'll never increment anything, in which case we kick it back up to 20. Background clears the screen. We take a little bit of a delay right here and it loops right around here. We should probably add one more command in here just so that we can see this a little bit longer. Let's go delay 1000. Now this gives you a chance to take a look at the beautiful screen art before it goes on and creates yet more beautiful screen art. And, oh, here's our super fine one. As you can see, it's coming along in very fine steps. Oh, this one's even finer. Okay, I'm starting to get a little bit mesmerized by this, so I should probably just close the window and move on. There we go. So uh, some different things that you can do for creating screen art using a series of uh, series of loops, or if you want to see it actually take place in here, a series of steps. So this would be a good point to pause right now and try creating some of your own screen art. Well, you came back. I hope you were able to uh, create some screen art and that you created something uh, that you're uh, uh, proud of. The next thing I want to take a look at is how we can use a little bit of trigonometry to uh, create some new commands and study a little bit more about how functions work. I'm just going to close this window down for right now and line at angle. Okay, let's see what happens if I run this one. All right, this should look pretty familiar to anyone who's been down to the beach and seen a snail or eaten a cinnamon roll. Here we go. We start in the middle and we just start rolling it outwards larger and larger and larger. Okay, now that could be a difficult uh, thing to do, but we've created a function that's going to help us uh, work through that. Let me close that and let's take a look at how this function is working right in here. Okay, so we start off by declaring some variables right up here at the beginning. Some of them are integers, and some of them are going to be floating point variables. Now, if you've used an Arduino, you've used the integer variable type a lot, because Arduinos, being a fairly simple device, really kind of struggle with floating point numbers. They can handle them, but it requires a lot of extra processing power. On a computer, uh, you have floating point abilities built right into your CPU. Computers still have to work harder with a floating point number because of all the extra decimal places and because binary math doesn't really build the concept of, uh, of decimals into it very well. But, uh, but that's okay. There's enough spare power in your computer that we can use floating point variables wherever we want. So it's just a different type of variable. Now, the computer will run into problems sometimes and it will let you know if you try to use a floating point variable 
where you've got an integer set up because unless you tell it how to take that floating point variable and put it into an integer variable space it won't make any assumptions it'll just say ah oh, can't do that you're taking a number like 5.3 and putting it into a container that was only designed to hold a number like five and then you have to tell it, okay i want you to round off the end i want you to round up i just want you to forget it or um anyways so floating point variables we use them a lot more on the computer than we do on something like an Arduino. And we're uh, creating some, uh, uh, some variables in here where we're going to start at midpoint of a 640 by 480 screen. And uh, we want to be able to draw a line at an angle. So the uh, regular line command in uh, processing gives you the start x point, the start y point, the finish x point, and the finish y point. But we would like to be able to use a distance and an angle. Now there is no draw angle command that exists in processing and that's because we're going to be able to create our own. And what you do for any time you're creating a function is you're going to come down here and outside of your setup and outside of your draw or outside of your loop in our Arduino code you're going to be able to come in here and you're going to define a new function. Now, uh, just as we say void draw defines the draw function, void draw angle will define our draw angle function. And you could give it whatever name you wanted. You could uh, just say void, you could call it DA, okay? But the name that you put in here becomes the command that you use in here to access it. Now the next thing that happens in here is you tell it what variables it should expect to be passed into that, uh, that function. So when you call the function from your main code right here, you're going to send it some information, okay? And it's going to take that information and whatever number you have put into start x, it's going to store it in a variable called x. So this x right here You'll take this value right here, you'll pass it in to right here, and then it can use that value right inside the program, right in here, and right in here. Same thing for y, it will send start y in there, and dist will come into distance, and angle will come into angle. Okay, so what is this uh, program gonna do? Well, when we run it, it is also going to call a function because this ADJ function does not exist in the uh, processing language either. We've defined it right down here. Now, normally you see that we say a function has a void at the beginning of it. And that's because uh, draw and setup don't return any values and neither does draw angle. But we want this function to do a little bit of math and return the value for us. So when we call ADJ, we pass distance and angle to it, and ADJ does a little bit of trigonometric math and returns the height of the adjacent side. Okay, let's just quickly pull up PowerPoint here, go back one slide, and let's just take a look at some of the math that's going on right in here. So you'll uh, recall from your high school trigonometry, perhaps, that uh, we can express angles in two different ways. Now, our common way of using it is from zero to 360 degrees. But mathematically, it also makes sense to express angles in terms of radians. And in fact, that was how a lot of the uh, initial calculations and development of this was all developed. So it's not surprising that when they had to make a choice in processing, being mathematically inclined people, they decided to make everything work in terms of radians. So it's not that big of a deal because you can convert angles into radians and ra radians into angles very easily because 360 degrees equals two pi radians. 180 degrees equals pi radians. 270, if you're worried about it, is 3 over 2, or 1 and a half pi radians, and 90 is 1 half pi radians. So the first thing that we do is when we send our number over, because I know you want to be able to use degrees, 
we convert it into radians. Now, once we've got that angle and a term that the computer wants to use, we're going to do a little bit of trigonometry on here because we're sending the computer the length of the line we want to draw and the angle that we want to draw it at. But in order to do that, we need to calculate the length of the adjacent side and the length of the opposite side so that we can create the new x and y point that we want to draw this line to. So uh, all that trigonometry, um, very applicable when it comes to computer graphics. You want to draw a length of a line at an angle, you need to be able to calculate the adjacent and the opposite sides, and that's where the cosine and the sine come from. Yeah, I'm sorry, I know you're you're all good with that, but uh, let's uh, just go down here and take a little bit of a look at how we implement that right in here in the ADJ command. So right in here, we are going to pass two values to it, the length that we want to go to and the angle. And so we're going to uh, calculate the adjacent side. First thing we do is we convert the angle from degrees. We divide it by 180 and we multiply by pi and we get our angle in radians. And then we can calculate the adjacent side by taking the cosine of the angle, now expressed in radians, and multiplying it by the length that we want it to be. We return the adjacent value. So this is going to be the number of steps uh, in the uh, y direction, uh, pardon me, number of steps in the x direction. We're looking at the adjacent value right here, and that's going to return right in here. So this entire formula right here is going to call this function, and it's going to return one number based on these two inputs that tells us where our new x position should be. And we'll do the same thing right here and calculate the opposite using our sine function right in here. And we'll send it the distance and angle. And it will return one value that replaces all of this. And we'll subtract that. Now, keeping in mind that when we looked at our uh, PowerPoint file, that if we start with 0 degrees right here and want to work all the way up to 90, 180, and 270, that when we calculate coming up right here, this is actually going to be a reduction in our location because the top of the screen is located right over here. So this is 0, 0. So this number is going to get smaller when you come up here. This number is going to get bigger when you move over this way. OK, and therefore we can come through here. We calculate our new x position and our new y position. And we draw a line from the existing x to the old x to the new x and the new y. So in our draw loop, it comes in right here and it executes the draw angle command. We give it where we want it to start, where we want uh, where we want it to start and the x and y coordinates. And then we give it a distance and an angle and it figures out where the new position should be. Now we can increase that angle a little bit. We can increase the distance a little bit. And we can say uh, the start x equals that new x position that it calculated down here, the new y, so we get a new starting point. And we come over here after a little bit of a delay, and we can watch that run. Let's watch it go and see it build from the middle out. Now, this is also a good chance for us to take a look at another useful feature that's built into processing. And this is something that you don't really get in the Arduino programming language, but is fairly common in most uh, computer programming languages. And that's called a debugger. And that's this little bug right up here in the top corner of the screen. You can also access it through the debug panel right up here by clicking Enable Debugger. And when Enable Debugger pops open, you get this window popping up right in here. And now you're able to execute your code. And as your code runs, it should be updating variables right in here. Now it's not because we haven't told it where we want to stop and take a look at those values. So let's just stop this for a second. And uh, what we're going to do in here is after we've gone through and done all of this, 
what we'd like to do is we'd like to come in here and under debug, we're going to toggle a breakpoint. Now I've got line 18 selected, so keep your eye on line 18, the one with the light blue shading to it, and you'll see that the line number from 18 turned into a little diamond right here. And that tells us that the code is going to stop right there. Now, you can make as many lines into breakpoints as you want, but let's take a look at what happens when uh, we uh, run this code in debug mode with a breakpoint in it. So what happened right now is we got our first line came out right here. It drew it at an angle of zero and a distance of five. And now if we want to progress any further, we have to click the step button. Okay, now the step button goes through and takes us through to the end of the draw loop. And it updates all of our variables right here. So now our uh, distance right here incremented. We'd come in and the first time around distance was equal to five. Well, now distance has been incremented by one. Okay. This plus plus means distance equals distance plus one. So we went from five to six. That's our increment operator. And if we uh, step into this one step at a time, there we go. It executes the draw angle command. We just got our next line drawn right in here. So this would be at uh, would have been at 20 degrees and six. And now when we go to do our next set of lines, will be at a distance of seven and an angle of 40. Okay, you can see that our start X and our start Y position are changing right in here as we move along. And each time that we update, uh, we move the new X that we've calculated into the start X right here. So we'll come along and we'll calculate a new new X. Let's step into that and there we go. We're incrementing that each time we go through. And now we can see that line growing larger and larger, and we can read the angles and the values as that goes through and calculates that all out. Now I hit the uh, play there. That restarted. I meant to keep hitting the step into. And so you can see things evolve one step at a time when you've got the debugger turned on. To get rid of the debugger, just hit the bug over here and the debugging tools disappear and your program will run as normal. Um, don't do it that way. Okay. It ran into a problem there because of the way I turned the debugger off. I should have stopped the uh, app first. So anyways, when you've got functions like this set up, it makes it fairly easy to draw something like that right in there. Or you can come in here and you can play around with some of your uh, uh, angles right in here. So maybe the angle doesn't increase by 20. Uh, maybe the angle increases by 2. And there we go. And let's try making our distance into a floating point variable. Okay. And let's uh, say our distance instead of plus plus, let's say distance equals dist plus point two. Okay. Let's run that. Ooh, different art coming off there. I've seen that art before lately and I don't like it. Uh, so our distance was increasing very small. Our angle wasn't increasing very much though. So let's see if we can increase that angle. Uh, let's set that back up to 10. Now we're getting a little smoother circle coming out of there because we're changing the degree at which we're increasing that angle, and we continue to get this interesting shape. Let's increase that angle even more steeply. And now you get a really tightly packed 
cinnamon roll. Now there's all sorts of things that you can do with this. You don't have to have this start in the middle of the screen by any means. You can move it off to the side of the screen. So right now uh, we're uh, starting this uh, location in the middle of the screen, but you could start over here at 100 and 100. You could start over there and away it goes. So things that you can play around with all sorts of parameters in there. You can also do some different things with your draw angle command in here. So I'm going to uh, uh, pull out some of this code right here. And because we've got a draw angle command now, we can put it inside a for loop. And you could say for, we'll use an integer variable uh, x. Oh, we're already using, no, we're not using x. You can't reuse variables uh, twice very easily, not your global variables. x equals 0, x less than 360 degrees. OK, and we'll increment x plus equal 10 degrees. So we'll take 10 degree steps on there. OK, and so what we'll do, that'll create 36 lines. And let's start at width divided by 2 and height divided by 2. OK. And let's uh, go at x and x. So we're going to have lines of increasing length at increasing angles as that runs. So you can start to get some interesting shapes uh, right in there. And what's really neat about this, of course, uh, is that you can go through and you can do some debug on it. You can add some stroke commands in here. So if you were to add a background command, stroke uh, 128, 128, 128. This is still going to be all grayscale. Now, I didn't do a very nice job of formatting that. Remember, you can uh, always come over to Edit, Auto Format it, so it all lines up. And if you uh, save that and go uh, Sketch, Tweak, then it's running right on here, all nicely tweaked out. And you can play around with some of your values in here and say, OK, we'll set that to red, set this one to blue. Uh, so you can play with your colors. Uh, you can change the number of angles that you want. You can change the increments that you want. There we go. Uh, you can uh, change the position. Oh, I dragged it downwards. I did my division by zero error again. You'd think I'd learn. Always look at that red line. It tells you what you did wrong. We've got to stop it. I'm not going to keep those changes. Go ahead and run that again. And uh, so you can play around. I was going to tweak it again and you can play with those variables and you can move it around just don't set it to zero <laughs> tweaking is dangerous when you set it to zero okay i'm gonna stop it right there and uh i'll uh not keep those changes uh you've got the code on your screen from a few different ones you've got some ideas on how to create some line art and i'm going to give you uh, some time now Go ahead and create a piece of line art.
all on your own. Add some colors, add some, you know, combine a couple of the things that we did on here, and let's see if you can get creative with some line art. That's the end of this lesson, and we'll be back with a little bit more.